Well, friends, they tell me this is Giving Tuesday, and I am giving thanks in this moment for all of you, and especially for our dear wife, who is sharing spirit with us today in our Star King Chapel time. It's wonderful to be in this intimate community with the sounds of the city nearby, with those of you who are joining us from places more distant than Greater Berkeley. I've asked Matthew to come forward to help gather us by the flame. And I would invite you to simply repeat after me the words of our chalice lighting, which are here in the room and in many of our hearts. With the kindling of this flame, the kindling of this flame, we reaffirm our commitments. We reaffirm our commitment to accept life's gifts, to accept life's gifts with grace and gratitude, with grace and gratitude, and to use them, and to use them to bless the world. To bless the world with the spirit of love. With the spirit of love. With gratitude, we join the community. Prayer for those who are gone. My love, my sibling, my parent, my friend, family. You are family to me. Your perfection is not required. It never was. Not to love you, not to grieve you. You are and have always been worthy. We know the truth of you, your love, your contradiction, your challenge. We know your laughter and hurt and hope. We carry you with us even now. So today we call you by your name. It is beloved. Today we allow ourselves to love you fully. Today we allow ourselves to grieve you honestly. We miss you. And we know that your life was a life worth saving. No matter your choices or your struggle, we miss you because grief is born of knowing. May your memory be a flame for the way forward. May it compel us to act as agents of resurrection, proclaiming loudly that every life is worth saving and all loss is worth, worthy of our grief. Amen. So at this time, you're welcome to come forward and light a candle uh, in memory of somebody who's been lost to overdose or other drug-related deaths.
our reading today is called Won't You Celebrate With Me by Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I have no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And now, friends, I invite you to join with me in the call to worship, which is found in your bulletin, as you read the dark print and I lead the light print. Let us declare this call to worship together. We are called to the power of the resurrection. It is not only a metaphor. We are asked to come alive again. Every day. And every day we are called to bring on our hearts. Our spirit. Our community. Our relationships. Back, back to life. Every day we begin again. And every day we love someone back from the tomb of oppression. Sometimes it is ourself. And every day we practice resurrection. We call it our resilience. We call it our resistance. We are called to be a resurrection people. We are a resurrection people.
a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 5 to 8. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. It's nice to get to bring my outside work <laughs> into my daytime work. <laughs> I like the merger. So thanks for the invitation to get to share this today and talk with you, not through the mail. <laughs> As I was sitting here, I realized uh, that when I created this service, I did it in the memory of a partner I lost to overdose. And I realized that the anniversary of his death is this Friday, and it's been 13 years. He was 20 when he died. And on the day of his funeral, it was in a large Christian church in Ohio. The sky was December gray, and the sanctuary was full. He was only 22. A year before, he'd asked me to marry him. But I wanted to finish college first, so I told him no. And he died a year later after overdosing on heroin and crack at the local Motel 6. We sat quiet and still in the church that day, cold, a bit emptier inside. And so the pastor's words had room to echo through us when he softly lamented just how easily she could have avoided going to hell. It echoed through us when he condemned us to the same fate. He told us that only the altar could save us, but we knew better. We knew better because we've been saving each other for years. Maybe our families kicked us out, our schools, our churches, but we remained. We loved each other through rehab, relapse, poverty, death. We knew better. And what that pastor did that day, it's not the work of the gospel. Shame can never be the work of the gospel because it's death dealing and not life giving. Our dignity and our access to divinity, they're related. You can't wound one without harming the other. 
Easter is my favorite holiday, which my friends have always thought I would was weird because I have never been particularly religious, which is strange when you're a minister, more on that. <laughs> <laughs> and before going to seminary, I thought Easter was just a day, but it's actually a season. It stretches from Easter Sunday through the Pentecost because Easter is meant to be a new way of living. I love it because it reminds me to honor and celebrate the simple and profound ways that people resurrect their lives every day. People change. They come back from the brink. They strive to bring their communities back to life. Every day, people defy the destructive forces of the world by choosing dignity, grace, and connection. I think it's worthy of our celebration. And I think it's what that pastor forgot that day what too many have forgotten. That Christians are meant to be an Easter people, a resurrection people. As longtime harm reductionist Marilyn Rand says, we're meant to spark life into people, not speak death into them. When I think of resurrection, I think of my friend Dave. After Kachi died, he came up to live with me at school. He was trying to stop using heroin and just needed a change of scenery. So he slept on my floor and I remember coming home after class and he'd be laying in the same spot, listening to the same Johnny Cash record over and over and over again. Those were hymns of survival for Dave. After a few months, he felt more confident and decided to move back home. And after a year, I finished school, and after graduation, I moved back home. I called him the day we got back. I got back, and we made some plans, but he never showed up. I didn't worry much. It wasn't that uncommon. But a week went by, and I still hadn't heard from him. And right when I started to worry, he called and asked if I wanted to go for a drive. That's what we do for fun in Ohio. We drive <laughs> through the woods, near farms, just away for hours. We were well into our drive that day when he apologized for standing me up. Then he got sort of quiet, looked out the window, and told me that he'd overdosed that day. He died. He decided to use one more time, and because his tolerance was low, it killed him. Luckily, his mom came home unexpectedly, and she found him unconscious and called the paramedics, and they were able to revive him with naloxone. But he'd been dead, and now he's alive. Real life resurrection. He owns his own business now. He's married to an incredible woman, and they have a daughter. Her name is Grace. But that wasn't the day that I learned about naloxone. In fact, neither of us knew what he'd been given. Nobody ever told us. We didn't understand how his life had been saved, only that it had been. I didn't learn about naloxone until I started working at the Harm Reduction Coalition eight years and far too many deaths later. Naloxone, which is also sometimes called Narcan, is a medication that blocks the effects of opiates like Vicodin, codeine, Oxycontin, heroin, and fentanyl. Its ability to block opiates means that it can be used to stop or reverse an opiate overdose. It saves lives. It's easy to use, low risk, and comes in three forms. You can get it as an injection, a nasal spray, and most recently an auto injector, which has a voice recording that walks you through all the necessary steps. But even among the media frenzy about the new opiate overdose crisis, one that's not actually new to communities of color, working class communities, or those living on the streets, many people still don't know that naloxone exists or how to use it. <coughs> In fact, I invite you to pay attention to news articles and segments about the overdose crisis. 
And if they don't include information about naloxone, I encourage you to contact the reporter and ask for an amendment to be made. It's unacceptable to report on this unnecessary loss of life without also informing people about how these lives can be saved. In 2017, over 72,000 people died of a fatal overdose in this country. All that death in one year. Now, sometimes we can go a little numb to the numbers, so let me give you some context. Last year, we lost 14,000 more people than we lost in the entirety of the Vietnam War in one year. And what's worse is that many of those deaths were preventable, but we haven't given people the access to the things they need to survive. We haven't given people easy access to naloxone or to fentanyl testing strips. Harm reduction, one of many approaches to drug use, has sometimes been controversial, but it shouldn't be, certainly not in churches. Harm reduction is a set of practical strategies that reduce the negative consequences associated with drug use. It meets people where they're at, and strategies can range all the way from safer injection practices to abstinence. Harm reduction is a movement of social, for social justice built on the respect of the rights of people who use drugs, including their right to live and live well. Simply put, it's meeting people where they're at and supporting them and keeping themselves as safe, healthy, and connected as possible without the condition of their sobriety. Theologically put, it's the unconditional love of God the love of neighbor, the work of the gospel. I worked at the Harm Reduction Coalition almost all of my time in seminary. And in some ways, they were strange worlds to try to marry. <laughs> but as time went on, I came to see them as connected. I went to seminary to learn how to bury my dead with dignity because nobody else ever had but it was harm reduction that taught me that resurrection was real. Across the country, folks doing overdose prevention work have count, handed out countless doses of naloxone. Collectively, they've helped save thousands of lives. But those lives weren't saved by professionals or caseworkers or paramedics or police. They were saved by people who use drugs. The vast majority of overdose reversals are completed by people who use drugs. And so it's drug users and their loved ones that have to have access to naloxone. Kachi came from a fundamentalist Christian background, and he struggled with both his love of God and his fear of God. More than that, he struggled with his own worthiness. He was queer and gender non-conforming, and a drug user, and he truly believed that God wouldn't love him until he stopped sinning. After all, that's what his church told him. So he tried. In fits and starts, he tried to be sober or celibate or more masculine, but he always failed, so he thought himself a failure. In my white working class community, we often measure ourselves against the unspoken standards of fundamentalist Christianity and invisibilized white supremacy. They reinforce one another. Both value purity, individualism, isolation, and perfection. Both call for rigid boundaries and threaten extreme consequence at their cost. Both tell us that we're the chosen ones, but only if we work hard and overcome all weakness. We live in a time where white youth are being leveraged against communities of color. A desire to protect their virtue, their purity, their abstinence has fueled mass incarceration of people of color and dehumanizing immigration practices. The subtext always being that people of color are responsible for the production and sale of drugs and therefore are a threat to innocent white children. The war on drugs uses shame, 
white supremacy, harmful theology, and criminalization as some of its most powerful weapons. It's ravaging our communities because the war on drugs is just a war on people. Hashi wasn't careless with his life. He was attempting to survive it. He wasn't trying to die. He was trying to live with the pain. Opiates are painkillers. They decrease pain. That's all. As people of faith, we have a role in ending this crisis. And we might need to begin with repentance. People who use drugs have been doing the gospel work that churches of all creeds have been avoiding. They've been preaching the power of resurrection and we're missing it. Worse than that, often we're making it harder. We make it harder when we attach shame, stigma, and yes, sin to issues of drug use and addiction. We make it harder when we suggest that connection to the divine requires moral purity. We make it harder when we treat people who use drugs like the other instead of like children of creation. We make it harder when we allow people to use words like junkie without objection because we know that the holy doesn't make junk. Today's reading reminds us that the Christian tradition charges us to raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, what if it's not a metaphor? What if the demon isn't what we think it is? What if the demon has never been drugs? What if the demon instead is shame and oppression? Perhaps the gospel is asking us to cast out shame and stigma from our places of worship, our hearts, our institutions, our loved ones. Perhaps the gospel is asking us to see how too often it is us that turns people who use drugs into lepers. It's possible to be people of resurrection, and it begins with simply recognizing that every life is worth saving. Every life is valuable, whether they get sober and start a business, or they continue to use. Every life is beloved by God even, maybe even, especially if it's messy. After all, scripture teaches us that like Mary Magdalene, when you sit in the mess, when you do not leave someone to die alone on their cross, when instead you sit at the foot of it and are willing to accompany them to the tomb, then you're there to be first witness to resurrection. It's not easy or simple. Not everyone lives. Sometimes the tomb stays sealed and always there is grief. Grief doesn't only come when a life is lost. So many of us carry the weight of grief with us everywhere we go. We've lost someone we loved or our sense of self or our plan for the future. And I wonder if some of the hostility directed at people who use drugs isn't actually just a distortion of our grief, an attempt to protect ourselves from being hurt again. We harden so we don't feel the hurt of disappointment or anger or fear. We harden so it hurts a little less when we see people we love struggling with something we have no control over. It's a form of armor that I know well, but I'm not sure it's working. There's still so much hurt, it just goes untended now for people who use drugs, for their loved ones, for our communities. We deserve better. We deserve to grieve. And people who use drugs deserve love, respect, and dignity. Drug users deserve the chance to live, even if their choices grieve us. For me today, 
Resurrection is getting to speak Kachi's name, Eric Kachi, in this place, from this pulpit, knowing that there is no threat of hell. Knowing instead that people are gathered to learn a skill that could have saved this life. Meaning that somewhere here, there's a group of people gathered who knows that his life was worth saving that he was beloved by God, no matter what, and that we all are. We're not saved at the altar alone. It takes a kingdom. It takes a willingness. The power of resurrection is in this room because it lives within us, in our hearts, and in our hands. We need only choose it. The song Spirit of Life is familiar to many folks in the room. It comes from a Unitarian Universalist canon, shall we say. And one thing that we learn of this song is that it is it was written and shared as a prayer. And so I would invite you as you pray to rise in body or spirit and to sing this song through with me a few times. First, as written, and the tune will embrace us. The second time, just to hum and feel the reverberations of the tune. And then the third time, where you see um, the words come unto me, sing in my heart. I invite you to breathe into the words us and we. And to notice and to pray and to be in song. So please rise as you're willing to name it. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind. Rise in my 
of naloxone and naloxone is the medicine that reverses an overdose. Um, how it does that is it basically tells your brain that there's no uh, opiate in the system. And so an opiate, if someone takes too much, is what can cause an overdose. And that would be anything heroin. Um, it's, you know, the most kind of no one, but with the opioid crisis right now going on, there's oxycontin, there's also Vicodin, there's um, morphine, methadone, and there's a huge long list of, of stuff. So um, the other great thing about naloxone um, is it, it has one purpose, it has the purpose of saving a life. So you can't get high off of it, you can't use too much of it, you can't, you know, I couldn't inject it, it wouldn't hurt me. You know, it only has one purpose, saving a life from someone who's overdosing and off of opiates. Um, so yeah, so we were lucky enough to get that um, and be able to, to give them out to folks. Um, there's two different kinds in there. Um, just a little background more on that is there's a, a muscular and a one, so you would inject it to, into the muscle. Um, and then we also, which we have now have, we just received a lot of funding for, and so my office is like boxes and boxes <laughs> of, of sign can, which is that's amazing. Um, is the nasal spray, which makes it really easy. So if someone is uncomfortable with the syringe, this is just you know, a lot quicker. Um, so yeah, we do that. Um, it's been, it's been really, it's been, I hate to use the word great program because, you know, why we're right here is, you know, not the best reason, but so many lives have been saved. Um, we get accounts of reversal, what we call reversal all the time. Um, people coming, you know, saving a life in this camp or a husband saving a wife, um, you know, family members, community members, neighbors, um, 
uh, visitor training for librarians not too long ago. And um, <coughs> it's, it's really heartwarming to see if the community kind of band together and address this issue because no more lives should be lost. So, um, yeah. yeah. And so in the kit, um, do you want to share a little about how to recognize them? Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing about recognizing an overdose that I tend to tell people and seem to do the best is someone is non-responsive. Um, you know, because usually if someone's in a deep sleep and you've all been in like deep sleep before, you're going to wake up, you know, if someone shakes you or calls your name, you wake up. If you were to do that to someone um, and they didn't respond to that, um, then you know something's wrong. Um, also, you know, uh, his lips kind of turning blue, you noticing that they're not breathing, um, or, you know, shallow breathing, less than five breaths per second, uh, minute. Um, is, is another good way. So, yeah. Yeah, and so when you respond to, to make sure they're really not just sleeping, um, folks will do a sternum rub, which is super uncomfortable. So basically you just grate your knuckles up and down someone's sternum with some pressure. And if they don't come to to that, um, then you can presume that they're overdosing. Uh, and like Roxanne said, it, uh, naloxone and Narcan are very safe medications. So if say that person was having a cardiac issue or a diabetic issue, giving them naloxone wouldn't harm them in any way. It wouldn't exacerbate that issue in any way. Um, and then you want to talk a little about rescue? Yeah. Position? Um, yeah. So, so once you've identified that, that someone is in an overdose, um, we do tell people um, to call 911, you know, um, and then also if they're not breathing is to provide rescue breathing. Um, and, you know, you can, you can do this by turning them in the, the recovery, there's a recovery position, which one I think my own picture is like this. <laughs> um, and then it's doing their breaths, holding their nose, and then breathing in, watching their, their chest rise and fall, and the noise come up. So, um, yeah, you can do that. Um, then you would um, do the naloxone, you would either inject it. Um, if you're going to inject it, it would be into the muscles. So it would be in your arms, like three fingers down is kind of what we recommend. So that kind of juicy part of the muscle right there. And then you also have kind of like your butt or uh, the love handle kind of little area right there, which is also good. The syringes that we have in there are um, big and scary enough that they'll go through clothes. So you don't have to worry about, you know, you can just kind of put it in there. Um, the needle is, um, you know, it's, it's exactly like if you're familiar with like the aspirin or allergy spray that some of you do, you know, and you basically put the, your two fingers under this and then your thumb would be the trigger. You would stick it up the person's nose until your fingers touch the bottom of their nose, and then you would just push in the whole shot. Mm -hmm. And if someone doesn't come to you, usually you wait about two minutes, uh, and maybe they'll need another dose, which is why there's multiple in there. Uh, and if you uh, just put it in the other nostril when you're administering the other dose, or if you're using injection, just don't put it in the same injection site. Mm -hmm. uh, twice. So if you put it on the right butt, put it in the left butt. Things you don't think you get from your church. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then just make sure that you're not leaving that person. Um, or a big, yeah, yeah. It's a big thing that we've been trying to work on is kind of the aftercare. Because um, oftentimes people don't even know that they've overdosed. Mm -hmm. So they're just kind of waking up from a sleep and, you know, would be feeling groggy, possibly in pain, um, going through withdrawals. And Narcan doesn't take like heroin or opiates out of your system. It just tells your brain that they're not there. So really staying with the person and making sure that they're okay and don't go use again and go back into an overdose or you know something like that. So staying with them for a good hour is, is a good idea if 911 is not helping. 
And just the other thing um, to keep in mind right now is there's fentanyl is a really strong opiate that's in a lot of the drug supply right now and not just in opiates. Mm -hmm. So things like cocaine, meth, crack, um, pills that people are receiving off the street uh, that maybe have been pressed and there's trace contamination with fentanyl. Uh, because it's so strong, there doesn't need to be much in it for it to be risky, particularly if you don't have an opiate tolerance. So anybody, this isn't just for people who use opiates, anybody who's using drugs um, and their loved ones should have one of these kits available. Um, for example, in my home state, the highest rates of overdose right now are from people who think they're just using cocaine. Um, they don't know that fentanyl's in there at all. Um, so also really challenging our understanding of what a person who uses drugs looks like um, how they behave, what drugs they're using. Uh, it's just good to have this on hand. And we'll be around after to ask if there's any other questions or if you want some help practicing. Yeah, yeah. So that's some practice. Thanks, Roxanne. Yeah. Thank you. So part of what um, we do in this work is to lift people who use drugs up as sacred. And for that reason, I like to put the naloxone on the altar because uh, it is an important um, tool for faith leaders and it is a really sacred drug. People in the harm reduction world who maybe have a lot of side eye about faith communities I often hear them talking about this as a miracle drug. Um, and so I want to give it its appropriate place. Uh, so we're going to bless the Naloxone before we invite folks to come up and receive it. New life is before us. I invite you to extend your hands in blessing toward these kits as we offer this prayer of blessing. Creator of resurrection and life, we come to you with grateful hearts for all the ways your love continues to rise up in our midst. We give you thanks and praise for the holy drug naloxone and the new life that it can bring. We know that we need each other to survive, so we ask you to bless these kits and all those who will use them and all those who will be in need of them. Make them and us instruments of resurrection that suffering will be released, that injury will be transformed, that joy will arise, that strength will take hold, that hope will take wing, and that death will yield us to a new life. Empower us to live into our vocations as people of resurrection, bringers of new life, proclaimers in word and deed of a new day rising. In the name of all that unfurls hope in our midst every day, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. So as we play this last song, uh, we invite you to come forward and take the kit. Um, also, if you need more than one, you're welcome to more than one. If you have someone close to you that could use a kit, feel free to take one. And the lyrics to the last song will be on the on the back. It's a YouTube version, so there's some improv. It's beautiful. <laughs> the language on our lyrics sheet is slightly different than the YouTube. Thank you. 